Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doctor Who Guide. I'm your host, Alex Patterson, and today I am joined by a very, very special guest, John Dorney. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. If you've listened to any Big Finish, then uh, you absolutely will recognize John Dorney's name. What a prolific Doctor Who writer. I don't, I don't know if I can accurately get across to somebody just how much you've contributed to the Doctor Who universe, how much you're uh, just you've had an impact on the extended universe of Doctor Who. Uh, in fact, I believe uh, you've written probably at least a little bit over 100 Doctor Who audios. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's somewhere. I mean, I I kind of lose count and of the, the tracking of it. In terms of in terms of actually written, it is probably over a hundred set within the Hooniverse, for want of a better term. I know that at the, the precise moment of talking, um, actually out, it's ninety eight of them. Though again, with all these things, it depends how you count because you know some of those are things like the destroyers and um, the, the various novel adaptations I've done, and you kind of go, well, do those count? I mean, I've wrote bits of them. Uh, but then at the same time, there are things where um, th there are a few scripts I script edited where I wrote more of them than I'm necessarily credited for. So I feel it kind of balances out a bit. Yeah, it, at the moment, I would say it's probably in the region. Actually written is probably somewhere in the region of about 110. Um, so there's because there are some which are written and yet to be recorded or yet to be released um and in varying different stages um i think at the moment even like right now i've got to do rewrites of three separate ones which um have all sort of turned up in the same week and i've gone ah i'm a, I'm a bit exhausted and i'm just largely putting that off to write a completely different script yeah amazing i mean that's well, that's just I'm finishing script editing one other last week so there's like a pile of three we're going okay could you not wow. like spread with your notes <laughs> yeah it either rains or it pours, um, but I, I just want to say on behalf of, of many Doctor Who fans, um, thank you so much for all of that that hard work. It's just such a joy. Um, and this this month, actually, you're talking about audios that you have coming out. Um, this month, I mean, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, What Lies Inside, you wrote uh, Paradox of the Daleks, two parts. Indeed. Yes. Uh, so that's come out coming out later this month the seventh doctor adventures sullivan and cross you wrote so that, london orbital that's out already that was out last last week no two weeks ago i think actually so yeah right right so then and then hidden depths for the ninth doctor adventures yeah. um you've got flat pack and that mm -hmm. yes and it's the weird thing with those as well is that they were written like masses of time apart in fact actually i think almost was it in reverse i think the first one i wrote of those so which was the same? So London Orbital. London Orbital was the most recent one that I wrote about six months ago. Um, Paradox of the Daleks was, I think, almost exactly a year ago. So yeah, I remember writing some of it while sort of drinking eggnog lattes in Starbucks. And then I think Flat Pack was maybe something like about June last year. So the fact that they came out within about three weeks, when you kind of go, it took a year and a half to write them. No, but, no, about a year in total, like beginning to end. Um, it, it does indicate the, the weird way the release system works in terms of how we write things and, and when they come out and when they're done. It's all timey wimey wibbly wobbly. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I can't can't write them in the right order. Was so you've now written for I believe Doctors one through eight, the War Doctor, the Ninth Doctor, and the Tenth Doctor. <laughs> if I'm if I've done my research correctly, um, have you? The in, in, right so a lot of different versions of the doctor do you have like a, a cheat sheet in your mind or have you just absorbed it enough that you've got this doctor's characteristics speech patterns uh tone of voice like do you have that all separately in your mind or um, and and how do you see the the consistencies of every doctor kind of lining up oh that's interesting i think i've like heard so many of the voices um, either of them doing audios in the obvious case of like you know Tom through Paul um, that it's sort of in my blood uh, for, for them and, and admittedly even then there's a degree to which they've all slightly shifted from their TV personas you know I mean I think you know, Peter in particular probably is a little bit um, uh, sort of drier wit than, than he necessarily got a chance to do as much of on TV he's a very very funny man and they kind of play him quite dry I think um, and but the, the others outside of that, there is a tendency for me to, at least the first time I write them, to 
you know, watch a few episodes just to sort of get my head back in the zone in it. Um, but weirdly, I've kind of been writing for, yeah, some of the ones I'm not familiar with relatively recently. Uh, in fact, the one the script I'm writing at the moment includes one who I haven't written a script for in quite a while. Um, but I didn't particularly feel the need to research this one massive, massive, because I think by it's almost like the first time you do it, you go, oh, and now I can unlock that. It's, it's sort of how it feels to me. I kind of know how I write the character once I've written them once, even if it's been, as it turns out, a while. Um, yeah, so I, I I think there are sort of certain similarities between them, but I, I I definitely think they sound quite different. I think every now and then you get one who, I think, I think for example, you could probably switch some of uh, Tom and Paul's dialogue if you if you needed to. I think they're kind of the closest. Um, there's something about the two of them in the way that obviously they bring something different to the scene, but the, the dialogue of the others doesn't quite shift in and out of each other quite as as, as easily as I think you could switch a Tom line to a, a, a Paul line if you needed to. Something like um, I find Colin an interesting one to write. I only, I've only really written Colin as the Doctor proper once. No, actually, technically twice. I think I wrote him a couple of lines in a Jago and Lightfoot. And, uh, and I found it really interesting that he, he struggled to get him to make jokes. Because um, mm. it, I, I always find it interesting that one of the key things in terms of writing the Doctor, I think, for anyone, is to remember that the Doctor is kind of a comic character. Uh, he's always got to be the funniest and wittiest person in the room. Um, and... And it, I always like to sort of compare it to like, if you look at any other shows, it, it's like he is the lead character's wise cracking best mate and just no one's told him that he that, that, that he shouldn't be the lead in his own show. It's why I think uh, Shidi Gatwa is such a, a great casting because he is literally the lead actor's wise cracking best mate in sex education. So you go, well, that's like literally everything I want that part to be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly Colin is an interesting one because it's almost like the jokes kind of happen outside of his lines in, in the things so it's almost like it's kind of his reactions to things rather than him saying funny things or the gap between what he says and you know and, and the pomposity which you try and dial down a bit because you don't want to make that the whole thing but yeah the gap between is sort of where the jokes land in there so you can't quite give him as many sardonic funny lines as you necessarily could and and you know mccoy i think is like sort of drops bon mo all the time it's little kind of like little slight wacky bombs of joke in a way that um you can't quite get with some of the others but yeah they're, they're, they're all ever so slightly different but ever so slightly the same right right uh and it reminds me of like when um pip and jane baker wrote time in the ronnie you could kind mm. of tell that that had originally been envisioned as a sixth doctor story yeah. that they were now alter you know altering for the seventh doctor um but especially with um audio i think that there is there's a difference in how you would write that because it is a vi uh, an auditory medium mm -hmm. um, where you need to indicate this sort of shorthand and things like, you know, comedy are really important because yeah. I think certain emotions become more important than what we would have for, say, descriptions in, in uh, the physical reading medium. Yeah. What were some of your initial struggles with audio? Because now I think, you know, everybody at big finish knows you know, oh we can we can count on john to put together mm. something that that works for our system for the actors and i know that you did do acting you've ha acted in doctor who audios before do you think that that contributed positively to being able to write for the actors uh in a way that's helpful for them when when they're doing audio well it's a that's a tricky one really um i mean it, it, it's weird to think back on that because obviously i've been doing it so long that yes. um, it sort of doesn't, you know, I, I don't even have to think about it most of the time. I mean, I think, weirdly, I think for me, one of the key things is I try not to think too visually. I mean, every now and then you'll come up with something and it'll be, oh, that's quite a visual idea. Um, and then the interest, something like The Red Lady, um, which I remember BBC being a bit wary of when it was sent in for approval, was kind of going, is it, you know, the finale of this is just them wearing scarves on their faces and drawing. And, and it's all about a painting. This, this is, and I'm going, I know how to do it. I know how I'm going to do it. I just know how I'm going to do it. Um, so yeah, a lot of it kind of comes without thinking. And I remember when I was doing like the Avengers audios, when I was adapting these old TV scripts, that was the interesting challenge of going, well, how do I take these things that were very definitely not room for this medium and convert them into a different medium without losing any of the lines? I, that was my sort of absolute rule because I wanted to keep every single one of the lines, apart from the one that was like beginning to end racist. But um 
uh, it's trying to make sure. Yeah, it's best it's best avoided. I think um, that there, there is some way going. Yeah, that was very much of its time. I I, I think it, it, a lot of it was listening and having listened to a lot of the audios and being quite used to that. Um, but then I think as well, it kind of helped because I started off, the first audio I did was I wrote sketches for a Radio 4 sketch show for about three seasons of that. And and that was kind of interesting as an experience. And that was effectively where I got my uh, radio training. Uh, and, and with that, because there were all manner of things I learned from doing that, because beforehand I'd been writing scripts and plays and things like that. And I tended to write uh, write it out on paper and then type it up. Which weirdly, I think if I'm right, I think I'm right saying Tim Foley kind of does with his scripts as well. We, we may have shifted that. But writing these sketches for audio when it was a real, it was a really tight turnover. It was a relatively topical show called Recorded for Training Purposes. And and there was one time when I remember I had my cousins from Australia over and I was able to like take them to see the show and basically told them that there was an idea we discussed in, a, in an office on Friday. I wrote it on the Saturday morning whilst they were having breakfast downstairs. It was recorded on the Tuesday. and was out on the, on the radio on Thursday. And and so that taught me things like, going, oh, I didn't have the time to write it on paper and rewrite it. The useful thing about doing that, just to explain why I did it, was that, that you'd write things and it forces you to edit. It forces you to do a second draft because if you've written the first draft, you, can, it, you know, if you type it up, I used to find myself going, well, it looks finished. Um, I don't have to change this. Um, whereas if it's on paper, you go, well, I clearly have to do another draft because I have to type it up. Uh, but doing it on it had to be so quick doing it over and over. But I think a lot of that, actually one of the people who's in that was um, was the great Ingrid Oliver, uh, uh, Osgood. Um, oh, wow. also, as well, also as well um, from from Ghost, Ben Wilbond as well. So there were a lot of really good people. In I, I can't remember particularly how I kind of sort of figured out audio in particular, apart from the fact, actually, I, no, I do remember there was one specific sketch uh, where it was just about... If I, this, it's more kind of in a weird way sort of thinking about the strengths of audio because uh, there was a sketch which involved um, a, um, a terrorist holding a journalist hostage and I would specify this was before this actually kind of happened in reality because it became a bit grim um, but the idea being that they would find ways to make the, 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 the hostage videos more um, more marketable and get dead out to more people and and there was a line in one where you know, they'd all start, which was again, it was Ben Wilborn saying, you know, your occupation is illegal, this is a message to the British government, and then something would happen that would indicate whatever they're doing. And I just remember one of them was the joke was, um, yeah, and the, the terrorist guy saying, now move closer to the kitty after he'd said that. And at no point until there did you know that there was a kid there. And it, that's why one of the things I think is great with audio um, is that you can so control the information when people get it. If, you, if it's a visual medium, people either see it or they don't. And so certainly with like comedy, I remember doing a show once where I had an appalling costume, but I kind of knew that there was a joke in the costume being seen for the first time. I had a, it was a green and red Union Jack T-shirt. And if you Google my name and like do image search, you might find pictures of it. It was quite a while ago, a good 20 years ago. And I, for some reason, I'm fatter. Um, but yeah, I got a leather jacket on and I, and I knew that I had to make sure the entire audience saw the T-shirt at the same time so that that, that would get the laugh. If they saw, if they saw it, Bit, you know piecemeal so it's just that men are going and zip boom and, and that was that got the laugh i think usually for me it's things like not thinking too visually you know I, I don't tend to have too clear an idea of what the monsters look like because i don't because there's no point I, i'm just gonna have to find a way of describing it as long as you get a vague idea of what it is that's good um there are tricks i use all the time um one of my my favorite ones it's weird we talked about comedy is, is jokes Jokes are a great way of getting description across. I think the example I tend to use is one from Foe from the Future, where it was absolutely vital that the audience knew that there are three of these monsters, the Pantophagian, um, have come along at the end of episode five or something like that. And and the, the, the way I did that was the doctor goes, oh, you wait all day for a Pantophagian and three turn up at once. And, and you kind of go, yeah, it's a joke but it is the description. It's told people, but you've disguised it and hidden it. Or there's, me or there's simile and metaphor is another way of doing it, but it's just like, um, you, know, you know, somebody makes a sarcastic comment on it. And spit. So there's lots of stuff like that, which but I kind of don't have to think about it too much. And I think a lot of it is down to just trusting what the audience can get and what, knowing what they need to know and knowing how much they can get from what you give and not being too reliant on the visual stuff. At the same time, it's a weirdly visual medium because a lot of it is about planting visuals in people's heads. So yeah, that's kind of the way it works. That makes a lot of sense because uh, I definitely find when I'm listening, there are times when I can be doing certain other types of work 
And if I need to think too much about what's going on to picture it in my head, then I find myself having to like, you know, go back 30 seconds again and, yeah. and listening again. So I think that's a mark of a of a good story because you're right, you're it's auditory, but so much of it plays like like a movie in my head. And I know like it's it's probably different for every everybody, but for me it's like a movie playing in my head. I'm designing everything. Yeah, I should be suggesting images towards you or general images, but then you should do the bulk of the work yourself. It's, it's largely letting you create the, the, the story in your head rather than me saying, no, this is what it looks like. Something I always feel like from a from a, a director's point of view, I tend not to like try, if I'm in studio, I tend not to suggest too many things to the director or whatever. If they there's a line reading or an actor gives a reading that's a bit off, I, I try to, unless it absolutely destroys the plot or doesn't make sense, I tend to avoid saying anything. And it's largely because our, uh, the director can make the version that's in his head or her head um the actor can do the version that's in their head as well they can't do the version that's in my head because that version is in my head and 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 being too uh prescriptive about that um i think is just you know no one's going to have a good time so you just go but well, just let them do the own version of it and hope it works out for the best of them what was a, a moment when you were you know in studio where some an actor just took a line completely or a scene a director took a scene completely differently and you thought oh that's that's good that's that's really good i hadn't thought of it that way i'm not gonna lie it happens all the time i mean i couldn't that's i can't think of anything really specific it's not it's not usually like an entire scene mm -hmm. uh, but even when it's someone where you're really familiar with their voice you know there are a lot of the actors i write for now where i just know how they sound and so i'm kind of vaguely got an idea of what they're going to say in my head and even then they'll still come in and bring something surprising new to the table um because that's what a really good actor does they kind of find interesting angles and and they are um slightly unpredictable and, and so on. you get that all the time with i mean i remember it with hugh ross with nicola walker a lot um you know pretty much all of the doctors i think from, you know from time to time there would just be moments where you're going wow this yeah this sounds ridiculously good i mean I, yeah i remember being in the studio for infamy of the zaros and then you've got david Tennant and, and billy piper doing this stuff and you kind of go this sounds like doctor who this is amazing i don't feel i've got anything to do with this because it just takes what you've done and knocks it up that extra level yeah yeah, that must be like such a, a fun and, and special experience to to yeah. hear your your thing coming to life it's one thing to hold your own your own story in your hands and read it um it's mm. another to see it illustrated and and yet another to see it brought to life as as a radio play you know we were talking yeah. about the um the what you can convey in the audio medium and uh, i think there was one story i think whispers of terror was one of the first that i actually listened to for big finish and <clears throat> it kind of showed me what the audio medium could do because there was a reveal where if it had to have been visual it would have completely spoiled the whole yep. story and i love what you did with the uh of course when you wrote for the visions in dalek <laughs> universe they're they're a, it's funny you, there are certain villains like weeping angels or the yep. visions where you're like oh my gosh it's either so visual how is this going to work in audio or oh this is perfect it's invisible so it's, <laughs> it's going to work great i don't have to describe this oh, yeah uh, yeah, I th <laughs> the Visions were one of those ones where I just kept going, I think I want to do the Visions, and everyone's saying, are you insane? And I was going, no, they're fun, they're fun. Just the, the, the joy of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I feel that I somewhat re redeemed the Visions, um, hopefully, because they, they, they're quite good fun. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of the interesting thing in terms of, like, as you say, like the playing around and and, um, and the tricks. I, I I rarely do that kind of thing. I do, I do. I think it's there's at least one or two where I've gone. Yeah, I'm very definitely playing with visuals. I think the most obvious one uh, where where it's literally because of the format and and audio is probably the Rocket Man, where um, where if that was told in any other way, it wouldn't. The, 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 there's the bit in that which everybody knows. We go, yeah, that that only works because of that because it's in audio and told as a narrated story. A lot, of the time, a lot of the time I see people kind of saying these things, oh, this could only work on audio and, and, and kind of go, but I don't necessarily want to tailor it too much for that because I find if you say something something could only work on stage, as, as that could, this could only be played, you pretty much go, well, that's just like, is it like it's a room? Is that, that all it is? Whereas, you could, but, whereas I kind of find it interesting if you take something and you go, this couldn't possibly work. Warhorse is a really good example of that in terms of stage. Warhorse War is an exceptional stage piece. Uh, and at least partially because you kind of go, but it's about a horse. 
how does this work? And it's the puppet and everything that they do to make it work is using every theatrical technique they can. But the actual core of the story is is a story, you know, I don't know, a love story about a horse. And there's a reason why, I mean, that it's way more tellable as a film, but nobody wants to see the film, particularly because the stage play is where it's exciting. Yeah. Exactly. You're, you're bringing that uh, innovation to to that particular medium. Um, yeah. I, 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 I like think... to make myself very much so have you seen the the frazier episode where they decide to do like a classic style murder mystery radio yeah. play radio I, and, radio ham or something like that yeah there's that one's yeah, great ham, yeah, really. yeah. I, I was like i bet everybody who's worked at big finish would just laugh hysterically at this especially understanding the world of producing audios and i think one of my favorite moments is when uh, you know, and I think that people appreciate that you as a writer don't try and step too much on the director's shoes and and how like Frazier goes, gives too much feedback, gives too much direction and drives Niles crazy. And uh, Niles just picks up this handful of balloons and a pencil mm. and starts, you know, making it seem like he's he's shooting all of the characters. And, and at one point he says, could could the two sisters stand back to back, please? I'm running low on bullets. And it's just, it's so hilarious because, you know, there's so funny. Um, and I think that listening through the different Doctor Who audios, you, you begin to see points where, and appreciate points where something new is being done. And, yeah. and it just, it again, it's such an, in a personal experience okay. because, you're creating it in your head and then it takes you somewhere new and that's amazing yeah also as well there, there is a degree to which it's kind of like down to the individual i think um nev in particular is great at doing and like, like just taking audio and smacking it out a bit and going well let's do something interesting and crazy with that um and but there are all manner of people doing things all the time where you're kind of going yeah let's see how that kind of works out um and yeah, I, 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 as I, said, I like to make my life a little bit harder because I think that's the most interesting way of telling the story. Sometimes you go, what's, what's a, what, yeah, we are, you know, that whole thing of we do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard and things like that. Right. What was the fastest, speaking of making your life hard, what was the fastest turnaround you had on a, a big Finnish audio, you know, and, oh. and how did you handle that? Was it like, locking yourself in a in a room and uh, throwing away the key until you were finished like how did that work <laughs> i mean pretty much i mean i i almost don't want to specify any too particularly because obviously i think if people kind of get it's one of these things the moment um you know the moment anyone kind of thinks with like say the the, the, the tom and lala stuff where they go well they can't be recorded together and you can hear it you can hear it they say you can hear that and you go you you literally can't you genuinely can't because if you know it it's it, it there is if there are so many audios where actors have not recorded together and you can't hear but the moment there's one where you think oh there definitely can't be those two can't be so that i can hear it yeah it's only when you flag it you go i can tell it, there was i mean i think there was a lot during lockdown that mm -hmm. i think i could say we had to write reasonably quickly um uh, fortunately a lot of the ones that i had to write quickly i kind of just had a ball with um there was uh should i say say one yeah well no i think, think i had one where i did that, that a reasonable amount of time to write something and i ended up with one of them writing about five thousand words in a day my usual is one thousand um and that's me admittedly that's me being quite lazy if i push myself i can do two um but what i but that one i was just having such a ball i was going i just don't want to stop writing this i just don't and i i'd um i, I think it is again with it's sort of like with um attention deficit disorder a lot of the time it's hyper focus and if i do feel i absolutely have to just like go right let's get through this and boom 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 i actually can kind of get into it what i noticed during that period when i was writing it quickly actually i wasn't writing that's the thing i should probably specify it wasn't being written quickly i was just like i was a bit more focused that's how i did it it was just i had to make sure I got as many this many words done and so usually i just kind of like i, I write 500 words they pop have a cup of tea do an interview, you know, anything like that, where I just kind of, I, I'll distract myself as much as possible. It, but this was no, get down to the table, start working at this time, keep going. But what I really found noticeable was I was also I was script editing at the same time. And my focus improved on those as well. Uh, because the amount of work I had to get done narrowed my focus and helped get the dopamine kick of, you've got to get this done, that distracts my brain with the ADHD. So I kind of went and somehow I managed it. Um, and it, I think I was kind of averaging about 
when I was needing to do it quickly, I was doing about 2,000 words a day. I can do more on that if I'm having a fun time. And, uh-huh. um, and, and in a, a few cases, yeah, it absolutely was. There were one or two where I just go, yeah, I'm j- I just don't want to stop writing this. And, uh, and it's just kind of feeling easy. We're, again, that's the other thing. If it's feeling like it's coming quite easily, usually it's going to be quite good. The ones where uh, I've struggled with it are the ones where I, I've not been as happy with the finished product. Um, there, I mean, it, it, it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, there are some where I've kind of come out thinking, oh, I think I've done a really good job of that, and people that haven't quite bought into it the way I expected them to. Um, but there are others where I thought I've had a really fun time doing that, and everyone else has had a fun time doing it. Um, so and then listening to it. So yeah, it, it, I, there's been quite quick turnover, as I'd say. You know, I can probably give you maybe about I think it's been a week is the longest for an hour long thing, of where it was maybe I think told about it on Thursday, had to have a full script by. A, a, Monday week after that and I was taking weekends off so um and that was one where you just go well whatever idea I have that's the idea and 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 in a strange way as well and this is why I think it's it's kind of um, you know awkward to think about I remember writing this one that took a week and just having a great time with it and really being happy with it and thinking it all came together really nicely and the one I wrote after this took me about three months and they're the same length. And it was just like three months of wandering around thinking about it. And then we got to the end of it. It's not as good, is it? It's not as good as the one that took me a week. How the hell does that work? And and I, I think there's at least the thing as well that you stop second guessing decisions. That's the thing. I, I think most of the, 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 you kind of just go, right, make a decision. What's a good decision? That. If I have the time to waste thinking about it, I will waste it. The moment I have to actually go, right, I have to write this now, something will come up to my mind because my brain will just go, right, think of something, think, 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 and it'll, it'll, it'll pop out. Oh, I mean, I can, I can relate on, on the level of having made weekly videos for six years now, over 500 of them. And it's absolutely true that like, for me, the deadline really helps. And I would not have made nearly as many videos if I'd done like an as I wanted to schedule, because there always seems to be this point in every t- video, doesn't matter what type mostly, where I go, do I want to just scrap this and start again? And you've got to kind of push through there and you end up with either a product that you're like, well, I'm happy, I'm really happy with that. Or you're like, that is good that like I got it done anyway. Cause I think that, oh, you I, know. It would be my advice to anyone doing anything creative ever is just give yourself a deadline. Because I think in the, you know, the years before doing Big Finish, I think so if it's on average, I start probably around about 20, 20, 2008, 2009, somewhere around then. I think I, yeah, the years before that, I'd written, I think, two full length plays, two. And obviously since then, I've written over 100. Um, and because, and, and you know, not just 100 doctors, I think it gets to about 130 if you're including in things from other Things like the Avengers and you know um, survivors and Star Fox and all that. Um, yeah, so I would never get anything written if it wasn't for a deadline. Absolutely. Right. Right. Well, I'm going to uh, share my screen because I've made a little something for you um, that I wanted to. Um, I wanted to because I felt like there needs there, there's not a. Uh, Guinness World Records just for Doctor Who, unfortunately, but I wanted to recognize your contribution to the Hooniverse, um, which I'm going to share now. It's a certificate of accomplishment that has been I've made for you for your contribution to the Doctor Universe by writing 100 big finish Doctor Who stories, uh, even signed by Doctor Who. That is lovely. It's got the new logo on it and everything. And beautiful. uh, I mean, the logo is also amazing as well. As in, I love the logo. And I like the kind of the, the stuff on the corners. Oh, well, that's delightful. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, I threw that together with a deadline at the last minute. So yeah. templates well, it's, were it's, great it's, on Canva. <laughs> it's weird. I think, I think number 100 is technically next month or some, at some point in the next couple of weeks. Um, here, here lies Drax is coming out and that's going to be number 100, which is, yeah kind of something i'm very proud of but also kind of too many but you know some of those things where you go yeah, it's kind of both so yeah we're here now we're here now uh but yes uh i do have a couple of questions from from people on twitter i told them i'm interviewing a prolific big finish writer today so they they have asked 
Um, what did you enjoy the most writing? That's from at Rich Otten over on Twitter. Uh, Which I think this is the seg segues well because we were talking about ones that just sort of wrote themselves that you yeah. really enjoyed. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the ones, yeah, there's a few like uh, where I'm just aware of hanging a lovely time writing them. And I think it's this weird combination of feeling that the story is good, this sort of weird sense of, I think I've talked about this in other interviews, that, that it's like you have the best seat in the house. You're the first person to figure out the story. You're the first person to hear these jokes. It can be a thrill. I'd, so I'd say something like, there's a few, buying time in the wrong woman. Had such a great time writing that. That was fun. And I, I kind of really love writing for the uh, the new series Doctors when I got the chance, because they are fun and fast. And uh, they're, they're just a joy to write. They kind of leap off the page. Um, on, a, on a similar level, Monsters of Metropolis, I really enjoyed Day of the Master. Um, that, that was simultaneously awful and great because that is, that's one where it, 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 it's hopefully not visible of how massive a technical exercise that was um, in terms of the logistics of getting it done and, and when things needed to be by how you needed to treat different actors, all of these things where uh, I mean, I can give you like one example. I, th I think at least part of the reason that happened is because of Last Tango in Halifax and Nicola and uh, Derek wanted to kind of do some stuff together. So that basically meant, right, I've got to do a lot of the War Master and Liv and the, how the rest of the story has to fit around that. Um, and the fact that I was kind of writing it and remember as, as I was writing, kind of going, I think this is quite good. I think the story, even though it was the most stressful storylining I've ever come up with, I had to, I think I started writing, I think I'd, I, I I was having to get it to quite a tight deadline and uh, in order to hit that I'd written the storyline of the first half and I thought I probably need to get this approved and get started writing episode one with no idea how it's going to finish I, no, I got a vague idea of how it was going to finish to be fair um, and I'd got the whole thing and then I think I hadn't even completed the storyline of episode two before I started writing episode two at least some I mean like I thought I could get a tiny bit far in because I thought I've got to get the, the three of them out of their cliffhangers. And the, the the way out of those cliffhangers are baked in. There is no other way out of those cliffhangers. So if they approve, if they disapprove that, I'm in trouble anyway. Um, so I might as well just write them getting out of cliffhanger. Um, but the fact it came together, I, that's that, that's one way where it kind of feels like a tiny miracle. Because almost any time I needed something to happen, it was just that they go, because so much of it, would, you know, there's a lot of I think there's a great Neil, Neil Gaiman quote about how he talks about writing is, is like Wiley e. Coyote running off a cliff and your job is to not look down because the moment you look down is the moment you fall and and with that um, it was just that bit starting off and going I hope I, I hope I get to the other side and the bits I can sort of mention that I think came together quite nicely was just the way I managed to waste everyone's wish we use up everyone's wish getting to the point and to bring them back together without having to make that happen, but everyone had used their one, including in uh, Fairy Tale of Salzburg. And uh, so that kind of happened without me having to try it and just a bit going because I knew I needed that to get the doctor out of the cliffhanger and you knew if it already used it and then Helen's got her, them all back together and going, and now they've all used them. But I didn't even have to try to make that happen. Everybody happened sort of naturally. The other bit that I mentioned um, was the stage direction in fa Fairy Tale of Salzburg was when uh Helen is sort of youthed again um the the, the line basically said the, the stage director said there's a sound which is a bit like regeneration energy I have no idea why I wrote that it turns out that's exactly what it is um and so things like that kind of happened by pure chance and that's why I remember writing and going, I'm having a great time doing this other ones I, I mentioned perfect prisoners I think that was great fun Mm -hmm. And again, that's where it just sort of seemed to happen. I was writing the story and going, I think this storyline is quite good. I think I'm going to have a ball doing this one. And and, and I did. I had a great time. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember if there are any others. I mean, Foe from the Future, again, is one I really had a good time doing. I really enjoyed the way that fell together. This is the thing. It doesn't necessarily connect with ones. I mean, as it happens, all of those, I think, are quite well regarded. But it doesn't necessarily automatically hit that. There are a few which are quite well regarded where I had a nightmare writing them. And it was just such a struggle that I can't quite love them. Um, and I, I, I openly say one of them is Absent Friends um, because it's one of the awards. So I'm aware it's, it's popular, people like it, and it's good. It's one where, and it wasn't an emotional struggle, such even though you might think that because it's, everyone knows it's about the death of my dad. Um, it was just some of the structuring stuff and it was having to rewrite it and go, no, this doesn't, this bit I planned in the storyline 
it doesn't work. I have to go back and pick that and do other things and shift it around. It was just sweating blood. And and it, it comes out quite well. I, I, I love, uh, but it's never going to be one I love. It's not one I loved writing, but I'm aware it's one that's, you know, one of my sort of my, my big hitters. So, yeah, I think I, there, there are probably others that I've forgotten because because there are a lot of them. Um, there's a lot um and i i have to say with the uh with buying time and the wrong woman the mm. cliffhanger between those two I, I my jaw was on the floor and <laughs> i was i i could not believe it and i i had to play it for my dad because we were going on a, a long road trip i was like you have to listen to these two audios you're not ready for the cliffhanger it it was wild mm. and um i just i so enjoyed that story and you just you're left thinking oh my gosh how how does this was so unexpected how are they gonna get out of this one and i think that's that's what you want in a cliffhanger um that was and- genuinely an idea i came up with like in the 80s when i was a kid and because i remembered thinking oh wouldn't it be fun if the end of you know i think it was around the time of colin regenerating and I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't that be fun if you like, like had the Doctor regenerate at the end of the season, and and the first story is with the new Doctor, and then at the end of that story, it's revealed that that, that isn't the new Doctor, and that the old Doctor is still. And I thought that would be an amazing reveal, and yes, and, and it took me a long time to even use that. It was only I was literally just walking around again. I think it was in lockdown, walking around trying to complete the story. I'd, I'd written the whole outline for Dalek Universe, and. And I got all detailed plot lines for everybody else, all detailed ideas for everyone's the plot line was. Mine was opening two-parter, probably involves time travel. And it was only when I was having to, everyone else had done their storylines, I just went, I've got nothing. I, I don't know what, what I mean, we I vaguely thought about Monk. Um, and 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 that was for all manner of reasons why the, and, and the Monk as a nun came from somewhere completely different I probably can't talk about. Um, but um it, it was all sort of swirling around the edges. And for a while, it was a story called Time Pirates, exclamation mark. And and I think the monk being chased. And that's that version of the story, I kind of had the idea of the, the, the Bible as a TARDIS, which I loved as an idea. Um, and I think I'd already got like a vision opening in my head because I'd got the idea of the, the beat of, of, of knocking out the lights, being, being taking away their advantage rather than their advantage, if you see what I mean. All of those things. Yeah. Um, and it was just like for ages I was wondering, I go, I don't actually have a plot. I don't have a plot. And then the moment um, my brain snuck back to this idea of the, from 30 years ago, I just went, that's the story then. And because it, it immediately gave me like, I know what the cliffhanger is. I know the reveal about 30 minutes later. And then having to figure out the beats from there to there to there. I think I just went back and I zoomed through and I went, I think this is really good fun. Are they going to allow me to do it? Uh, and they did and it was all very very delightful so um yeah that was that was an exciting one to come up with and i think i think it's one of the ones i'm happy to tell people because yeah as i say i think the cliffhanger as i knew i knew it was going to break the internet and it did so (laughs) it was just exciting absolutely did and it was already such a big you know first you know release and range in general and then Mm. i mean it was just it was it was a precursor i feel to the um the power of the doctor ending right you know we still mm. had that such a surprise reveal knock your socks off break the internet and i i love that so it was fun you know going back and listening to that and in, in preparation for this um i want to fit in this uh the another question from uh, yes. at mark blaze one uh, is there any extra pressure or stress when writing the world of doctor who um and we talked about deadlines but what other sort of uh stresses would you would do you encounter Oh, um, I mean, uh, there's a certain sense of responsibility. You kind of want to, everyone to enjoy it, even though obviously that's never, ever going to happen. Um, I mean, it's, there are a few sort of odd moments every now and then. I do remember, I think I was in studio. It was in studio for Infamy of the Zaros when the actual announcement that uh, David and Billy were doing the audios came out. And just that moment of going, oh, this pairing means so much to so many people. And I hope we come close to doing justice to it. And if anything, that kind of feels like it's it's a it's a thing with a lot of the modern stuff of that sense of I want. Um, I, I mean, it's it's weird because that's the only time I really felt that because a lot of the rest of the time you just want to tell a good story and you can't worry too much about anything beyond that. Um, and you know, 
so, so it's weird because I, I think something like say Monsters in Metropolis. I was I was I was really excited for that one. I thought I really like the story of this. I think this would be good. I'm aware this is the ninth Doctor meets the Cybermen for the first time. That's going to be a thing people are going to talk about. But at the same time, I, I think it's a good story, and and I'm, it's still a script I'm really happy with. Um, but certainly it's there's no particular responsibility beyond that or no kind of pressure beyond that other because the moment you kind of think about that uh is the moment you're going to not be able to write anything you know, you're going to second guess yourself all the time um i think the, the only pressure is i just want people to have a good time i think want people to enjoy it and as i say not everyone will it's not going to happen every single time um somebody would always dislike some aspect of it or it'll move away from their platonic ideal of what a doctor who story should be um but um yeah, I, 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 I think different people have different th- feelings with it. I mean, I, I think for me, yeah, I'm aware that I sweat blood over the storylines. That's the bit I hate. That's the bit that takes forever. Actually, writing the script tends to be quite quick, but I know other people do it in a slightly different way. So I know Roy Gill takes ages delicately um, manufacturing all these beautiful uh, words because he's amazing. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's a different sort of, we, you go at different paces, but each are equally valid and do different things. You know, his is all sort of amazing poetic, uh, lyrical pieces um, and just filled with such sort of glorious imagery. And mine are kind of usually a bit fast and a bit kind of um, comic and cartoony and a bit tarty. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I don't think there's any specific kind of pressure as such that I, I necessarily feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other than actually genuinely. I always think one of the things, the best things that ever happened to me was um, my first ever Doctor Who that came out was Solitaire. It was the second one I'd written. Um, the first one I wrote was called Echoes of Grey and they came out in reverse. And the thing I remember was that Solitaire hit quite well and people seemed to like it a lot. And then when Echoes of Grey came out, there was the the like the, um, note on Big Finish website that said, from the writer of the acclaimed Solitaire. And and there, that, so there was a degree with that where I remember thinking, oh, Oh, okay, that's that's a thing. And then special features came out a few months later, and that again had us hit quite well, and people liked the 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 inventiveness of it. And so there was the sun realization, I suppose, of the pressure to kind of keep at that sort of level. And I think that's a useful thing. I think that um, I am at least aiming to keep to a certain sort of level. I I don't want to just. I could, in theory, if I'm given a brief, I could quite easily go. Well, you want me to write an hour long thing? I can probably just come up with something quite quickly uh, that will exist no i want them all to be really good i want them all to at least i'm aware that my name sort of is a marketing thing um that people have certain expectations and i want to aim to get at least close to that so that you know again somebody will always be disappointed by something but ideally i want everyone to get to one and go oh you know it's a john Donnie. it's still it's still consistently good and i think it's because right back then right back with release number two it was the awareness of going oh people might be buying this on the basis of previous work and I suppose that's that's a degree of pressure. I feel I want to at least be in the same ballpark. In my book, you're absolutely keeping that level, if not exceeding it, with oh. your your audios. And uh, yeah, it's been. It, I always, you know, I saw your name pop up so much that I was like, this this writer knows what they're doing with Big Finish <laughs> and can be can be relied upon for a, a good storyline that's inventive and um that works within the the frame of audio one thing i noticed about your your writing is that it uh, and maybe it was just the in particular the the dalek universe stuff but i love that you took not sort of kind of non-linear storytelling and used that Mm -hmm. to basically cut out a lot of the the exposition i remember one line in in dalek universe where the doctor's like saying well you know i can't wait until we get to Sheldrake Industries and just that moment where they had skipped like the several days well, they, of space yeah, travel yeah. in a sentence. And and I love that. And then sort of, you know, starting in the middle of the action and filling back what's happening, um, mm. you know, starting with the scene of the, the murder rather than, you know, people getting murdered and then people coming along and finding out, oh, these people were murdered. You know, I, I really appreciated that and and enjoyed that as a, as a listener. Um, oh, and like... Okay. We're doing that from a from a writer's perspective sometimes where it's just a bit going every now and then it's just fun to mess about with it a bit so right um i think yeah the one one i'm doing at the moment just because i feel i can say this i, I hope i'll be able to be allowed to do this properly um so i've written one where it's an hour-long thing um but i presented it in two halves uh, following one person and then the other half is following a, the other person and in my head they're happening simultaneously in real time 
and in the same location and hopefully um i'm hoping the sound design is going to be match up exactly not that anyone will ever know because obviously you'll only be listening to one and then the other that, that hopefully so this explosion happens at the same point in both stories for example um and that's a fun thing to write about and again that's this bit of going yeah i'm just going to do something fun and interesting structurally and see because no one's done it that's always the thing i like to do i like to do something that no one's done before as well that's that's always high on my list it, because it's also and also something i've never done before because again what's a way to sort of challenge myself and keep it interesting and and, and uh find new angles and yeah it's so exciting um i feel it's just wrapping my, my life. head around that <laughs> yeah it was it was inspired by an Alan Akebourne play called House and Garden. In fact, that's two plays technically: House and Garden, which again, yeah, um, done where where in two two buildings. Yeah, it's an amazing like mind bending play. Two plays. Uh, I saw it at the National Theatre in the Olivier and the Cottesloe. No, the Olivier and the Littleton. And uh, yeah, they're basically one play has happened, but but the out the garden and the sort of the dining room of the same house, and the cast from one run from one theatre to the other um and it's all happening in absolute like specifically timed yeah it's amazing oh my goodness that yeah what a technical achievement that is oh my goodness um the you know we're we're coming up on on our hour it's absolutely flown by and i'm so grateful for for this time to, to talk with you i like to ask for a tip for people getting into writing doctor mm -hmm. who for people who are writing doctor who and I just feel like this whole conversation has just been so helpful with all of these tips. But if you could um, give like a, a concrete one, somebody wants to to pitch the big finish. What do you think is a, a nice quick tip? I've got, I've, well, I've got a few. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a few things because I, 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 I have a couple of standard things as general things for writers. I have two major tips, which I always think sound a little bit of name, but are really important. There are two tips. The first one I mentioned is this is one, start it. Uh, because the amount of times you've got an idea and you just start a blank page, you don't get around to doing it. No, until you've actually started writing. The moment you start writing, it will be easier to do. The moment that page is not blank, you'll be able to write it. Uh, can you guess what number two is following that? Rewrite it. <laughs> and the... Finish it. Finish, so start, it. There we go. finish it. Because it. Work your way through to the end. And that's the point when you can rewrite it. Uh, don't, don't start. Don't rewrite it until you've done a draft. Because and also there are all manner of things like, um, never judge your first draft against anybody else's, okay? Because everything you've read, everything you've seen has gone through multiple drafts. So why do you expect yours to be perfect when everybody else's, everything you've ever seen that you're judging against has gone through multiple drafts? You're on your first draft. Um, deadlines, give yourself a deadline. Um, if you don't have a brief, give yourself a brief, okay? This is, this is the thing about if you say to someone, tell me a story, they'll go, um, if you say tell me a story about an elephant they go okay well there was this elephant um it was a bit lonely in its herd it didn't get on with people you've given them one word and they've been able to come up with a story and so if you kind of have this moment anything you do go well, i want to write a story about this or that or whatever doctor who specifically there's a few things i kind of uh suggest to people as a script editor i i think that a really good doctor who story is one where you can basically not exactly summarize it but you can sort of say the setup in a line okay or like a single sentence so Milsters in metropolis is fritz lang accidentally cast a cyberman in metropolis that's one sentence it's got to be what's a cool idea central cool strong idea day of the master everyone in the universe suddenly gains the ability to regenerate again all of those things are a strong idea and you go that's your spine that's everything has got to that's got to go through the entire thing everything else has got to hang off that like the ribs um it's no good having, I've literally been discussing this with one writer where they've pitched an idea and gone, you've got loads of cool ideas. They're all cool ideas. They're not connected. What's the strong idea driving through the middle that you can hang the rest of them off, connect them all back to that. And that's when you've got a really good strong. And I think it's true of any, like of the, the, the TV ones. Um, I, I, and you know, there's also something fun to be said about like having big, slightly tarty moments. I think that I, when I did Day of the Master, I was a bit influenced by Russell T. Davis talking about things like that. I wanted to go, what's a big, big moment? So the cliffhanger of the regenerating is part of that. Um, and again, obviously, the cliffhanger of buying time is a similar kind of thing. Um, in, in terms of pitching to big finish, I think there's a few things to kind of uh, be aware of. I think, I think obviously, it's a, a thing that lots of people would like to do. Obviously, people, so there'll be lots of people pitching. I think, I, th I think anytime you see something saying no one's suggested to do submissions, Okay, people miss out the important word in that and, and just hear the first and the third. 
unsolicited is the key word. Okay, I got in by being aware that I got other things. And so the, the, the key factor is get your work solicited. Okay, and the way to do that is to write other things and have a certain degree of a body of work. All I think it requires is some reason to assume you would be able to do it to a reasonable standard, like to a professional standard, but at least at very least a reasonable standard. So we can at least go, oh, you know what, this person's done this, this and this outside. We'll bring them in. Um, and so you've got something to send in. Just sending an email saying, I'd love to write one. We go so with lots of people. How do we know? And don't get me wrong, I think there are people being missed. I absolutely think there are being pe people being missed because I was missed for a decade. Uh, you know, and there are other people who've taken a long time to get in and you're going to go, oh, they're really good. And I know they'd have loved to have done it years before. Um, so it, it's a bit frustrating, but it is a small company and can't really have any major things. So I try and sort of keep an eye out for things wherever possible. And I've got a few people in from time to time. Like, you know, I've got David Barnes in, uh, a couple of others I probably can't mention because I don't know if their stuff is out yet. But you know, other people. So I think that is probably the key thing is is to have something to show and that just gives a sense. And also not Doctor Who, actually. I think that's probably an important thing. Something, you know, we read Doctor all the time. And uh, so I'd send in something that isn't Doctor Who that just gives a sense of you as a writer. Because uh, often it's not actually necessarily that vital. Again, I'm working with someone at the moment who isn't really a Doctor Who fan, um, doesn't really know terribly much about it, and they were a bit worried and they wanted to drop out because they go, I don't really think I'd, I'd have to do too much research. And you go, no, it kind of gives an interesting different angle, is if you're telling a story that isn't very, very Doctor Who, that's the kind of story we haven't heard that often because, you know, the, the ones of us who are Doctor Who fans kind of tend to write within the same tropes and um, things unconsciously without even really thinking about it. We kind of stick to some fairly specific rules. Um, but yeah, so I think... Um, I, I, I think sending is something separate because also as well there, there is I've had at least one friend who's like sent something over and where it's just this bit going you've you've done so little research on this I, 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 and it was a, it was a bit frustrating it was just because I can really help but but at least do a tiny bit of research but also if you are writing doctor you're not familiar with it that is the point where you just kind of go I don't know what I'm talking about if you submit a doctor Who thing it's a, and it's a little bit kind of like no 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 just just and something else um but obviously i think if people are watching this and they're not audio fans i don't know why they've watched this for an hour um <laughs> to get the tips um in terms of doctor who stuff I, yeah i think write something else um and also just have a general interest in writing in general um uh i seem to remember there was like literally a doctor who magazine article about writing for doctor who, which for some reason if i remember rightly was illustrated with a picture of joanna lumley and sapphire and steel this was like like in the 80s. So it's a long time ago. I don't understand what that was. It was like about issue 90 or something like that. And I think that was one thing that's best. It says, if you've got an interest in writing something else, that's always going to be helpful. And I was writing other things. And not least because it's going to teach you how to do it. And there's actually, that's probably another tip. Sorry, I'm just waffling on with endless tips. Right. This is amazing. Write as, you can. Write as much as you can, because there is nothing that te teaches you how to write as much as writing. Um, you can read as many books as you like um but don't be too beholden to them i kind of find lots of these script writing things a little bit you, you know there's I, I th there's a lot to be said for something in, in terms of something like i don't know um save the cat which i yeah, find the not to speak in of the day because i know blake snyder is no longer with us it, it's it, i'm not massive fan of the approach he's got but some of the structural things are kind of interesting i was somebody pointed out his like story the robert mckee book which i haven't read in any detail because no one has um but it's it's kind of useful, I think, as thinking of these things as like a manual for your car, a Hayes manual. Haynes, Haynes, whichever one it is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not really good with cars. Um, it, you wouldn't read that and think, I know how to build a car. But I will look at it when my car breaks. And that might tell me how to fix it. By and large, I think this is a Moffat thing, but I think it's absolutely kind of spot on. Also, watch... So you, you watch TV, you watch film, you watch plays, hear as much as you can, read as much as you can, get stories into your blood, because you will read something and go, okay, this isn't right. I know this isn't right. You try to work on it instinctively, and and you see something, and you know when something is right when you watch it, when the plot kind of works. You go, right, okay, this doesn't work, that works. How do I make that into that? And that's the only way of doing it, really, and just kind of having a sense of going, it's not quite a story yet. How is it not a story? Why is it not working? Um, yeah, I think that's probably at least that's that's one tip. Just there, I just don't want that's that's a masterclass right there. Uh, so thank you so much. <laughs> I do need a cup of tea now. I'm not going to lie. Has this ever been done? Um, 
and if so you know why why not but uh choose your own adventure doctor who story where uh either you could at the end of the cliffhanger part one choose part three part two part four and it would all sort of wrap itself up or different tracks i don't i don't know how you, how it would exactly work but i think that would it, be a very funny fun... I, I i did do one called you are the doctor which is a one parter um what the, what you're saying again eightborn is really fascinating because eightborn does a play called i think it's called sisterly feelings uh, which is a four-act play and yeah at the end of act one they toss a coin and depending on what happens in that Act two, the second scene of Act one is different, and then I think there's another coin toss or something, and again two other scenes. But what's amazing with that, and why Eggborn is an absolute is a genius in the most literal sense. I don't use the word genius terribly often. He's a genius. So scene two and Act two, scene one are both it could be like one of two. So, but the first scene and the last scene are the same. So whatever happens in the middle, it gets back to the same point. And at least part of that is um, he's, he's got this idea about who you, you kind of end up where you're supposed to be is the theme. And so I sort of did that with uh, this one called You Are the Doctor, which is a one-parter where it skips the tracks. But the thing I kind of wanted to do with that, which I often do, it sort of did it with special features as well, um, is um, I, I I kind of always want to make it part of the story. So there is a reason to tell it that way. I think if it, there's there's a, there, there's fun gimmicks but you kind of go no a fun gimmick is great as long as you've got a good reason to tell it um so for example with the one i'm saying about where it's two simultaneous ones yes it's a fun gimmick but at the same time it meant that i could because the problem i was having was when i was trying to write it in the traditional cut back and forth sort of way it just diffused the tension but if i did it in both and i could go i can just go straight through and keep the tension timed up tightened and tightened and tightened and just keep it tense so there was a good reason to tell it that way so the, that that's kind of winding back and doing more more sort of advice and uh, yeah so I, I had fun doing that one that was that was a giggle. That's awesome. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I mean, if there's any way to tell a story in a non-linear format, I think Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey is a great playground in which to do it. It's um, great. It's always good. I like doing that stuff. Well, thank you so much for for sharing your incredible. You know, knowledge of, of writing Doctor Who for having done it so many times. Um, just once again, thank you for that on behalf of all the Doctor Who fans who have all of these wonderful stories to extend our Doctor Who universe and get to know these amazing, wonderful characters even better. Um, thank you for being here, spending your time here today. Thank you to my friend John Fisher and to your friend who, you know, connected us and made this possible. I really appreciate it. Oh, and right. um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight. Thank you.